So hi everyone, uh, so I'm Doris Arjumanian and along with Rachel Frizel, uh, we are going to provide an overview of our chapter where we try to follow the gas motion from bubbles and filaments to cores and discs. And so here on this, uh, you, on this slide you can see the list of authors uh, that contributed to this uh, chapter and so we work together to uh, review recent uh, observational and theoretical results to combine together and propose a comprehensive view of the growth of structures in the interstellar medium leading to the formation of stars and planets. And so our picture of the star formation process can be uh, summarized with this figure here, which shows, uh, uh, which highlights the va various levels of interstellar structure spanning a wide range in, sorry, spanning a wide range in scales from large scale, 100, 100 parsec scale bubbles down to uh, parsec scale filaments and uh, subparsec scale of cores and disks. So uh, while these uh, different levels of interstellar structure are uh, interconnected and exchange matter and energy, they are all characterized by different 3D geometry and different physical processes are do dominate their evolution which suggests that there is a partial decoupling between the different uh, levels of interstellar structure and it makes sense to identify them, analyze them and discuss them as individual structures. So in the following, we will provide uh, some results that uh, highlight the importance of and the link between these different uh, structures of interstellar medium. So I will first uh, describe the role of expanding bubbles in the formation of filamentary molecular clouds uh, and the fragmentation of the filament into cores and then Rachel will discuss the properties of uh, cores, dense cores and the link with disks. Um, so there has been increasing evidence of the role of uh, bubbles in the interstellar medium generated by expansion of supernova, uh, supernova explosions that shapes the interstellar medium. So. Uh, we have seen all seen this uh, beautiful JWST image that shows the ISM dominated by bubbles. And then for me, this is very similar to what was proposed a few years ago uh, from the theoretical side. And also yesterday, we heard the nice story of the local bubble by Joao. And here I show also a nice image which shows uh, expanding uh, two H1 shells shown here in red and blue, which interact with the molecular clouds show, uh, shown in green. Um, and so this expansion of uh, bubbles, they compress uh, molecular clouds into sheet-like structure where filaments form, and in particular, star-forming filaments form. So in the following, I will uh, discuss uh, the formation of uh, the molecular filament that leads to star formation. So here I show uh, a few examples of numerical simulation uh, studying the effect of expansion of large-scale bubbles on the ISM. So large-scale bubbles uh, on the ISM, in, uh, so on this plot here on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side you can see a parsec scale, a smaller scale simulation, which shows very nicely how the uh, propagating shock compresses the initially roundish spherical uh, clump into a compressed 2D sheet-like structure where filaments form. And so by combining uh, near different simulations of shock compressed layers with different magnetization and turbulent level, uh, theoretical models for filament formation can be classified into five types, which are shown here. And I will uh, go into details, a bit of details to explain the, form the different types of uh, filament formation within these sho shock compressed layers. So I will start from the right. So the first type is the type I, which corresponds to filament form at the interse intersection of two sheets. So this mode works only in highly sporavenic and unmagnetized turbulent, and which is not very realistic with the observation suggesting of the ISM being in trans-alvenic turbulent. So the second type is the type S, uh, which corresponds to filament forming through shear by expansion of over-densities through the turbulent, forming filaments that are uh, 
parallel to the magnetic field. So these ty types of filaments, they, are, they have usually low line mass. Uh, they are like the H1 filaments, and uh, they do not become sarcomy. Uh, the, the next types are the type G and C, uh, so where uh, filaments are formed through the converging flow along the magnetic field within the shield, and the filament in this case is formed perpendicular to the magnetic field. So in the type G, uh, the, the, the flow is induced by gravity, uh, but yes, pure type G filament formation are possible only when there are no density fluctuation and turbulence is weak. And so in more realistic uh, conditions, the flow is generated by turbulence. And so this is the type C for filament formation. And the last type is the type O, uh, where O stands for oblique shock compression. And so in this uh, mode of filament formation, the filament form at the converging flow of uh, uh, at the conver convergence where of two flow in a band-like uh, sh structure where the flow of in the conver con curved sheet is generated by oblique shock compression. So to summarize filament formation uh, in this shock, comp uh, this model are in two-step process where in the first, uh, uh, firstly, uh, compressed 2D uh, gas uh, layers are formed uh, from shock compression, for example, induced by expanding H2 region, uh, expanding large-scale bubbles and or maybe H2 region also. And then within this shock compressed layer, uh, 1D-like cylindrical filaments form due to the matter flow uh, anisotropically within compressed sheet-like structure along magnetic field line. And uh, so Abe and collaborators, they did similar, uh, s s several simulations by varying the velocity of the shock compression, and they identified a critical velocity of about five kilometers per second um, that defines the type of filament formation. So when the velocity of the shock is smaller than this critical value, the type C dominates, so filaments are formed due to turbulence. When the velocity of the shock is larger than this critical value, the type O dominates, so oblique shock compression in, in induces formation of filaments. And in, in this type O mode of filament formation, because the, the, the shock compression is uh, high velocity, massive filaments are very quickly formed within a fraction of a million units. And this can be also seen in the uh, um, filament line mass function derived from the simulations where initially the filament line mass function has a steep uh, slope, and then the filament uh, evolve in, ma in, in, uh, in mass, so grow in mass by accreting surrounding material, and then the slope of the filament line mass function becomes shallower, and actually become with the, the slope becomes of the order of the Salpeter slope of the, of the IMF. And here I show the observed filament line mass function, which is very similar to what is observed in simulation, suggesting that maybe the filaments also grow, form and grow as we just suggested. And so, uh, as you can see on this uh, filament line mass function, the uh, small line mass filaments always dominate in mass and in number. And then the evolution of these filaments depend on the time scale of the shock. So once the shock attenuates, Unbound filaments stop evolving and disappear through the turbulence. But once a filament is self-gravitating, it is long-lived and grow in mass by accreting surrounding matter. So to summarize, dense molecular filaments form through type O and type C mechanism and then grow in mass by through accretion and ac gra uh, gravity-induced accretion. And gravity can also uh, be important into collecting filaments that are formed separately into bundles. And uh, this type of accretion um, onto uh, self-gravitating filaments are suggested by uh, transverse velocity gradients observed across self-gravitating filaments. So here I show a beautiful example of this from the observations. And this kind of transfer velocity gradient wouldn't be observed if the infall of matter or the accretion is isotropic uh, from a cylindrical structure or a spherical structure, but could be observed only if the uh, infall is non-isotropic and within a sheet-like structure. And so this accretion is important in 
understanding the evolution of the filament. And here, uh, so I will give some properties of filaments for uh, in ther th from the theoretical models of isolated filaments in hydrostatic equilibrium. And so these models, they, so they say that when the uh, line mass of a filament is of the order of a critical line mass of stability of these filaments, then these filaments are prone to gravitational fragmentation and the spacing between the fragments is equal to four times the diameter. And when the filaments are, have a line mass which is larger than twice this critical value, uh, which is of the order of 16 solar macroparsecs uh, for 10 K molecular cloud. So these supercritical filaments are expected to collapse without fragmenting and their the width is proportional to the thermal gene slant. So if magnetic fields are included, these properties changes a little bit, but overall there is, as I will show in the next slide, there is discrepancy between what these theoretical models of isolated filaments suggest for the uh, pro filament properties. So what do uh, observations show is that uh, filaments that have line mass of the order of the critical value indeed fragment and form stars, but also observations shows uh, filaments that have line masses much larger than this critical value, which also fragment to form stars. So here you can see some uh, examples of, of observations. And the observations, the observed core spacing uh, uh, is uh, not equal to four times the diameter, but it's more equal to um, uh, the filament diameter, and which is, co which is also equal to the um, uh, virial gene length. Um, and uh, also there are observation uh, signature that there are two modes of fragmentation with a large scale mode and small scale um, fragmentation mode. And simulations uh, showing uh, filament accre accreting matter from the surrounding medium uh, show that they can fragment and reproduce this observed spacing of cores, which suggests that uh, this, uh, these filaments are uh, not isolated, but are in the interstellar medium and accreting and, uh, from, from it. And another important also result is that uh, the filaments that are star forming, they have uh, line masses which is uh, close to the virial line mass. And by virial line mass, I mean uh, effective virial line mass, taking into account kinetic uh, turbulent uh, support and also magnetic support uh, that uh, are both important in order to uh, support gravitational, uh, to support filaments against gravitational collapse. And the fact that this, uh, so the observation shows, as you have heard earlier, that uh, the velocity dispersion increases for line ma high line mass filaments, which suggests that the virial line mass also increases uh, with the line mass, uh, suggesting that uh, the internal turbulence can support these filaments against uh, gravitational collapse. And the fact that these uh, filaments are in virial balance uh, is also important in order to understand another property of the filaments, with this, which is their, their inner width, which is observed to be of about uh, 0.1 parsec, uh, which is also uh, uh, of the order of the effective gene length. Uh, so while these filaments, they span a broad range in uh, central uh, column density and uh, line mass, as you can see on this plot. And so these two quantities show a linear relation and the proportionality between these two uh, quantities is the, the width. So the fact that these uh, two, 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 two quantities show a linear relation suggests that the, the width doesn't vary much between this, this filament. And here I show uh, the distribution of the uh, inner width of uh, filaments observed in nearby regions where this, uh, the, the Herschel resolution is uh, eight times better than uh, the median width observed towards this filament, which suggests that uh, this width uh, is well resolved and gives an in indication on the physical property of the filament. And, uh, uh, and the fact that these filaments have uh, uniform width and uh, the value it's 0.1 parsec have, may have in in implication in our understanding of the colon density threshold for star formation. So here on this plot, I show the core formation efficiency. 
which is uh, the mass within the core divided by the mass within the cloud uh, at dif different uh, column densities uh, in the cloud. Uh, and so since most of the cores form along uh, um, uh, filaments, the background column density of the cores correspond to the column density of the filaments. And uh, since there is this relation between the line mass and the column density of the filament, then the, the column density of the filament can be uh, sh uh, expressed in equivalent uh, filament line mass, which is shown on the top x-axis. And so here on this plot, you can see that uh, the core formation efficiency rises at the column density of about 7 AD, uh, why, uh, which corresponds also to uh, um, line mass or about 16 solar mass per parsec, which corresponds actually to the critical line mass of 0.1 parsec wide filaments. So this suggests that uh, now we can understand the origin of the column density threshold as being uh, the, the, the column density of filaments uh, that, that are critically unstable and fragment to form cores. And another important also of uh, the width of the, fi the filaments is that it gives uh, a particular uh, mass scale for fragmentation. Uh, so there are uh, recent observations that, that show tentatively that uh, the median core spacing, uh, the, the, sorry, the median core mass observed along filaments increases as a function of the line mass of the filament. So higher core uh, mass uh, form along higher line mass filaments. And uh, the median core mass form formed uh, along a given filament is of the order of the gene's length, which is of the order of the line mass of the filaments multiplied by the width. So here I show two examples of core mass functions that fit at different line masses, at different core masses uh, for the filaments that have different line masses. And so now if we look at the uh, full fi uh, filament line mass, so the one that I showed earlier, we can see that the star forming filaments are dominated by transcritical filaments, so filaments that have line masses close to 16 solar mass per parsec, and the genes mass of this uh, uh, genes mass of these filaments is of the order of 0.5 f 0.5 solar mass, which corresponds actually to the peak uh, of the observed crystallor core mass function, which is shown here in blue, which suggests that uh, the critical filaments uh, are fragmenting uh, into cores that correspond to the uh, peak of the core mass function. And also, so this, uh, on, on this line mass, uh, filament line mass function, we can see that for the supercritical filaments, the filament line mass function shows a slope which is of the order of the Salpeter slope of the IMF, which is also seen in the core mass function, which suggests that the core mass function is inherited from the filament line mass function, uh, where higher mass cores form along higher line mass filaments. And so the CMF has been proposed as the origin of the IMF, and now with this observation, we suggest that the filament line mass function may be important in order to understand the origin of the CMF and consequently that of IMF. Okay, I will stop here, thank you, and Rachel will continue by giving uh, some results on the dense cores property. Thank you, Doris. Yep, I am uh, Rachel Friesen from the University of Toronto. Um, so I'm going to talk now about uh, the growth of structure and evolution of cores um, on in molecular clouds. Uh, and so dense cores uh, are the birthplaces of stars. And of course, uh, they've been the topic of several previous uh, protostars and planets reviews. Uh, so I refer you to those for some background. And I'm going to focus more on what's uh, new since the past uh, last protostars and planets uh, meeting. I'm also going to focus on uh, low mass cores uh, in particular, and um, with the caveat that I'm going to leave uh, the fragmentation discussion to uh, the talk um, after the chapter after lunch. And thank you to uh, Marinouche and Kate for talking about magnetic fields, which I'm also not going to talk about in detail. I just wanted to highlight too, uh, you know, when we talk about starless cores, we're often uh, defining our cores in terms of their uh, star-forming properties. So protostellar cores 
are identified by the presence of infrared emission or more recently by the detection of compact ALMA sources that might indicate there's a, a, a deeply embedded disk or young source there. Um, and then the definition between starless and prestellar is generally focused on whether or not their mass um, is greater than two times the critical Bonner-Ebert mass. So tell, uh, discussing how likely they are to actually gravitationally collapse. So um, masses that are lower we define as starless. Um, and then prestellar are those that have line ma or core masses that are um, large enough that they should be uh, possibly gravitationally stable. Um, so one of the big things that came up since um, the last protostars and planets, of course, is this uh, knowledge that cores are, uh, particularly these star-forming cores, are primarily found in filaments. Um, and another, um, which is very important to understanding how they grow um, and evolve. And then also that um, we have many interferometers that can start probing the, uh, the structure of these starless cores and protostellar cores um, on very small scales in multiple tracers. Another big change since um, the last protostars and planets is that you know, we have these beautiful um, broad Herschel maps and, and other continuum maps from the JCMT that target nearby star forming regions uh, in, in exquisite detail. And now we also have a number of large scale surveys that focus on molecular line emission to provide the kinematic counterpoint to those surveys across as much of a, you know, a larger scale as we are able to do um, with, the intra with the instruments we have. So I'm showing a list of a few different surveys um, that focus on nearby star forming regions. Um, there's also some posters uh, that you can check out if you're interested. And here I'm showing you the Aquila region uh, in column density of H2 from Herschel and reprocessed by Ayushi Singh. Um, and in the white contours are the outlines of the survey uh, area from uh, the Green Bank Ammonia Survey in Ammonia. Um, and the dark contours highlight where we see the ammonia. So it highlights very well the high column density regions where the filaments and the cores are found. Um, and these surveys cover a range of uh, molecular line tracers, tracing lower or moderate density gas in the CO and other isotopologues through to higher density gas in ammonia and M2H+. So that, of course, like I said, gives you that kinematic counterpoint to the continuum survey. So here is the same map, and now the color scale is showing you the line of sight velocity um, across this region. So it's the serpent south and W40, and you can see that the line of sight velocity actually doesn't vary um, a huge amount across the entire complex. Um, just a, a quick side note, and I'm not going to get into too much detail, but of course uh, the question of how you identify structures and where you draw the line has already come up this morning. Um, there's definitely a number of different algorithms to identify cores in these observations, and of course because they're embedded within filaments, how you define a core and how you subtract a background does matter in terms of understanding its properties. Um, and so uh, in observations, you know, you're limited by what tracer you're using. Simulations have all the information, but then making that transition, how you identify cores in simulations versus in observations, you know, you need to make sure you're comparing the same kinds of objects. So I refer you to the chapter for more discussion on that. So what do we learn from adding those kinematic uh, properties to our, our data? And again, I'm going to focus on cores. Uh, there's a rich uh, wealth of information you can learn from filaments, of course, once you add in the kinematic information. One thing we can do is, is aim to produce a more complete varial analysis of which cores are actually um, unstable or, or gravitationally bound or bound by other components. And what we're finding is that in many cores, when you factor in the, uh, kinematic or the kinetic energy and also the bounding pressure from the turbulent gas or perhaps the weight of the cloud, um, pressure actually dominates over the gravity. And so here we're showing that um, for a number of cores in nearby star forming regions, um, the pressure term dominates both for cores that appear bound, but also for cores that appear um, unbound. Um, in some re nearby regions, uh, work by uh, Hope Chen also identified uh, these uh, very uh, compact cores that were uh, very coherent, so their velocity dispersion is very low, uh, close to the sonic uh, level within the radius, but they're also very small, and so they're not gravitationally bound, but they're uh, instead bound by the uh, external pressure, and they follow along a line there, uh, that is lower mass but follows a similar trend um, in terms of um, the cores that we already observed. 
Uh, when we look at simulations, this idea that uh, cores are not necessarily gravitationally bound, you can find this in uh, various simulations. So if you have two-stage fragmentation, so fragmentation from filamentary structures, can produce cores that are appear vir uh, virally unbound at first, but then over time evolve to become, um, you know, have lower virial parameters. Um, and so uh, you can also uh, look at simulations and models where filaments and cores form dynamically uh, and form simultaneously, and then you get a range of core properties uh, that range from cores forming as, as pressure-bound objects, but also uh, gravitationally bound as well, and then the evolution that happens afterwards. Um, and so one interesting um, study is, the, this is work by, by Ochner et al., where uh, looking at uh, cores, tracking cores in MHD simulations, and then using machine learning to um, categorize the cores based on their properties, uh, found that you can actually separate some of these objects into different phases where you have um, cores that are um, bound, which are the phase three, cores that are coherent, uh, which are the phase two, and then turbulent dominated cores, which are phase one. Um, and one, there's, there's a couple interesting things about this, and I refer you to Stella's poster for more information, but first is that the, the evolution of these cores might not necessarily follow a, ver a simple trend where cores can actually go between these different stages. Um, and in the case of cores that are um, quiescent or coherent, uh, some of them end up as very long-lived objects and don't necessarily form stars. You can also try and map based on the information you have, the, the observational observed cores, onto the same kind of um, structure and, and see where they lie. And of course, the protostellar and pre-stellar cores do lie within this bound phase three uh, selection, but then we have these other cores, which uh, some of which may or may not form stars. Moving on to core dynamics, like I said, you know, uh, we have now a lot of observations that allow us to probe the internal dynamics of cores, uh, you know, from uh, single dish to interferometer observations. If we look on the core scales and look at what, uh, you know, are cores collapsing, um, 10 to 20 percent of starless cores show in fall motions. Um, and again, here the starless cores are starless and pre-stellar. They weren't making a distinction. Um, and the infall motions are largely subsonic. Uh, but with just a core scale measurement, we really can't um, discuss too much, you know, different models of how cores might actually collapse under gravity. Um, and so now with these high resolution observations, we can start looking at infall and rotation within cores. And, you know, really re resolved kinematics are required to test these infall model predictions. And when we look at cores in small scales, we can see here that even though a core might show really uh, what looks like, you know, uh, a smooth velocity gradient consistent with rotation, when you look at the uh, position velocity diagram, there's actually quite a bit of structure in the velocity, maybe multiple components. And so that's something that we can tease out uh, now with higher resolution observations. Uh, and so here's another example here, uh, looking at a, um, a young protostellar core, uh, where if you uh, try to match the velocity profile, you need to include modeling that includes both uh, rotation and infall onto a very uh, low mass source. Uh, when we look at the evolution of angular momentum, we have cores, and we've traditionally looked at velocity gradients <coughs> across cores as indication, or at least we uh, uh, measure it as, as solid body rotation, measure velocity gradient to interpret that in terms of its uh, angular momentum. And so when we do that, um, here we've compiled a list of um, a number of surveys that have tried to measure the angular momentum, the specific angular momentum of cores as a function of core radius. Uh, and these core scale studies give a power law relation that's somewhere between solid body rotation um, and turbulence. So you're, you're kind of in the middle. So turbulence is still playing a role in terms of the overall angular momentum of these cores, um, kind of on all the way down here on scales. Uh, when we look to resolve studies, looking at what's the going on in the um, internal motions of these cores, um, there's been a few studies looking at um, protostellar cores to try and track that evolution of angular momentum down to uh, predicted radius where it should, uh, it's predicted to flatten out and have constant angular momentum. And this transition point and how that angular momentum uh, is reduced as you go to smaller and smaller scales is going to play a strong role in the size of disk 
that can actually um, be uh, Keplerian and supported and rotating around a protostellar source. Um, and so here there's just a few measurements and we're, we're starting to see uh, in some cases we do find that there is an observed um, transition where you move to uh, a constant angular momentum. In other cores, um, and this is work by Pineda et al., um, you know, we go down to very small radii and don't see any indication of a turnover yet. So again, um, this is really going to play a role. It's limiting where the class zero protostellar disks are able to form and how big they can get. And um, velocity gradient measurements at somewhere around 1,000 AU present a range of actual uh, specific angular momenta uh, values, which kind of suggests that there might be a broad initial set of conditions for disks. Um, where is this angular momentum coming from? Kind of stepping back a little bit. Um, so we've heard that, you know, if we have cores that are fragmenting um, from, sil uh, from, from filaments, um, we, there's a, a paper showing that you can get the um, observed angular momentum, uh, specific angular momentum dependence with mass uh, if that angular momentum is, is inherited from the filament. Um, we also have surveys or studies that show that you can get um, the same relation if it's inherited from the turbulent cloud, so showing that, that turbulent uh, importance in terms of the angular momentum. Um, and also in, uh, an is anisotropic accretion from the environment, thank you, uh, where uh, the angular momentum uh, here is showing the uh, angular momentum of the core and then the angular momentum of episodic accretion onto the core from, uh, from the surroundings. And what we find, or what the study finds, is that the angular momentum can be randomized and increased by a bit, quite a bit from accretion from that, you know, filamentary structures outside layers onto um, cores. So cores to accreting disks, most cores do not form and will not evolve in isolation. Um, there's been recently a number of observations of streamers, so this is velocity coherent narrow structures funneling material around YSOs. Um, and again, this would be a source of non, uh, isotropic accretion onto disks. So we have accretion onto cores, perhaps accretion onto disks. It's been detected in multiple species. Um, and this requires modeling to confirm. We have a very smooth, in the sources that we've detected, uh, smooth velocity gradients and rotation. Um, and they've been detected in a few different, um, uh, few different sources. And the infall rates of these streamers can be similar to the protostellar accretion rate. So it's a way of continually uh, increasing the uh, mass available to accrete onto the protostar. Um, and we can see these around uh, more uh, evolved sources onto class one and class two sources. So this is a beautiful example of HL tau, where you also see not only uh, this uh, streamer that you see in the emission, but in shocks uh, emission from SO, highlights exactly where it seems that the streamer is landing on the disk. And in this case, at least, the, um, the streamer accretion, if that's what's happening, uh, isn't actually impacting the structure of the disk. But of course, with only a, a few objects, we need to understand this in a little bit more detail. And so I want to highlight, this is a really popular topic. There's a number of posters here, so I expect to hear more about streamers at uh, the next Protostars and Planets. Um, we see uh, asymmetric infall um, in uh, simulations, so this uh, in varying MHD setups, we uh, see this, um, uh, these, these, these kinds of streamers. And the other thing that's, that's interesting is that, you again, we're looking at connecting the scales. So extremers in some simulations seem to connect from large scales right down to the very small scale. So accretion onto cores, accretion onto disks. Um, and it's all, it's all kind of seem like it might be connected. But of course, what we need to do now is thank you, really um, use our data and increase the data that we have at really uh, high resolution sensitivity and use our modeling to kind of compare predictions uh, to understand how important this accretion is um, and how uh, much of the mass is going to end up in the final protostar over time. Um, so I just wanted to end with some open questions that uh, kind of come out of the discussion in our chapter. Um, so polarization surveys, uh, thank you to, again to the, the, the hard work that's been done by all the uh, magnetic fields people. Um, polarization surveys should allow critical tests of filament formation models. Um, so, you know, truly trying to understand um, what the predictions are and what we see. 
Uh, and similarly, the structure and orientation of magnetic fields within filaments and cores will affect core stability. So I didn't include that in the discussions. Thank you. Um, but uh, at which cores are truly pre-stellar, and so how do cores evolve? How much of the mass that you end up with in a, uh, in a core comes from the outside to the inside? When we define a core, is that the mass that's really available for star formation? And then looking at where do we find the break in angular momentum? How well can we disentangle this complex kinematics? And how important are streamers to protostellar accretion? So just want to thank again our co-authors, and then uh, Doris and I will be available for questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the, this chapter is open for questions, and please remember that we will have the a, a conference photo just after this Q&A session. So please remain here. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Nagayoshi uh, Hashi from uh, AJA, Taiwan. So I, can you show the last slide again? Uh, yeah, showing open questions. Which one? Last slide showing our uh, open questions. Oh, yes, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering the, your fourth point, you know, at which radius in a break in a angular momentum in the processor course, which I'm very interested in as well. Uh, but uh, what you're asking is that uh, there might be uh, some uh, specific radius where we could expect to see the, uh, you know, a uh, uh, break, or, you know, in some sense, uh, uh, such a radius could evolve based on you know, evolution, like class zero or early phase, the radius might be very small, but then later, you know, the radius gets larger. So I, I just you know, want to get uh, more comment on your, you know, from you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I wasn't really uh, saying that there should be uh, an expected, expected radius. Um, you know, pro probably there are some models that predict where that radius is for various stages of evolution. But I think, you know, what we're saying is that We've only been able to measure this, you know, observationally for a few objects, and so, you know, if we want to start investigating where that break is, you know, we need some observational data. So I think um, my question is really more like, can we do this for more objects, um, you know, in the next, you know, five years? Okay, thank you. Okay, from back. Thanks. Um, this may be a question for Doris. Uh, I'm Rewards for Kareli University of Toledo. So if uh, filament formation is hierarchical in nature and happening at all scales, as we saw in the previous talk, doesn't that automatically rule out this idea of a characteristic width of a filament of 0.1 parsec, which we mostly saw in nearby filaments only, and observed with one kind of uh, facility, especially Herschel? Um, like, um, I, I don't know, what's, what's your view on this idea of pushing this uh, 0.1 parsec as some kind of universal thing um, it's a characteristic of a filament or something like that. Uh, how about, we, we have learned that the filaments have different uh, sub-filamentary structures also. Also farther away you see you have other kind of radius also. In one of the plot, uh, the parabolic nature, there was a broad distribution. So I, I just wanted to see like how you um, feel about that. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there are different aspects in your question. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, regarding the, this in, the, in, the importance of a possible uh, uniform width for filaments has implication in fragmentation of the filament. So it's important in our understanding of uh, the star formation process. Um, and so it's important indeed to um, make sure that this observational result is robust and it's not um, affected by um, observational bias, bias being maybe measurements or also uh, angular resolution of the observation. So when we want to talk about the filament width, I think it's very important to uh, make sure what kind of data we are using and what kind of analysis we are doing. And, um, and then, um, uh, mm, the idea of uh, the hierarchy, hi hierarchy of uh, interstellar structure, I mean, that also depends on the angular resolution that, that you are observing. So if you talk about large scale, uh, 
100 parsec scale filaments at low resolution. If you go at high resolution, you will end up by, by seeing small scale structures. And so here what we are seeing in the, in the, in the observations is that uh, at a given distance, at a given uh, scale, we can observe measure a width which is about um, 0.1 parsec. And uh, so coming back maybe to uh, uh, the, the relation between uh, the filament width and the length, um, so which was shown by Rowan saying that there is a, a relation between these two. And actually maybe, but on uh, this plot, we can see that uh, the filament length is much broader uh, than the filament width. So if there is a slight tendency of having broader widths for larger filament, maybe that's an uh, interesting uh, aspect and we have to understand if that's really the case. But on such a plot, we can see that actually uh, there is a difference between uh, uh, the distribution of length of the filament and distribution of uh, the width. And also it's uh, kind of understandable that if you look at in large scale cloud, uh, you would expect to see longer filaments that when you look in smaller scale, scale cloud, you can see uh, smaller, uh, smaller length filaments. And for example, this could be understood in this kind of uh, filament formation process uh, by shock compression. So for instance, if you look here, here you have a parsec scale clump that uh, where filaments form. So the longest filaments that you can form in such a clump is like parsec scale uh, length filament. So if this clump is larger and then the shock compression forms other filaments in that larger scale, uh, then you would expect to see larger scale uh, filaments. So I think it's, uh, it's very important to uh, uh, make sure that at what scale uh, we are looking and what kind of uh, filaments we are discussing. Um, mixing uh, inhomogeneous sample of uh, measurement, uh, I think it's not very uh, interesting in order to discuss um, uh, any physical processes because inhomogeneous sample of filaments can, uh, of structures can come from different uh, physical processes uh, and uh, mixing everything can, we, we cannot identify uh, specific uh, um, physical mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the wonderful Hi. talk. Um, I'm Joe Nainan from Tatian Institute of Fundamental Research in uh, Mumbai. Uh, so I had a question regarding the, the, towards the end of the talk, you mentioned about the randomization of the angular momentum uh, direction of the protostellar course. So do you have any comments or thoughts on like, you know, what is the degree of randomization in any given cluster by these different streamers or different mechanisms? Are they completely randomized or you still expect some bias? Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what I would predict. Certainly the, the Kuznetsova paper predicted that overall the, the velocity gradient directions would end up being completely random. Um, I would tell you to stay tuned. Uh, we are in the process of actually trying to correlate uh, the orientations of cores, velocity gradients, magnetic fields across a large range of, of objects. So um, in general, I, I think um, we do see a lot of randomization. And you can see that in the orientation in some cases of outflows, which tell you about, you know, uh, presumably the orientation of the disks. In some filaments, they seem to be, you know, perhaps aligned, but in other regions, they, they have tendencies to be more random. So I think we're, we're seeing that, and we'll, we'll see more of that uh, soon. Okay. The back. Uh, Yichen Zhang from University of Virginia. Uh, so I have a question about uh, the streamer. Uh, so I wonder if uh, if uh, the grid material uh, join the disk from a streamer and um, um, the streamer deliver material like as a rate as high as the accretion rate. So would that like each event, each such event uh, significant change the angular momentum uh, direction of the, the disk or causing the disk, uh, 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 how can the disk uh, keep the, 
uh, same uh, uh, direction uh, uh, for long time? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I think something that, uh, like I said, the, there's a number of papers on, or posters on streamers here, so it's it's a fairly new, um, uh, fairly new detection. Um, some of the accretion rates do seem to be uh, similar to the proboscellar accretion rates. Whether or not that's, you know, uh, one event or a few events, or you know, you have it over a longer time, uh, would uh, affect you know how much the angular momentum of of the object has changed. So. Um, I think right now I can't say, uh, you know, if there's only one event, you know, or multiple events that would have an impact on, you know, the overall uh, variation in the, in the angular momentum. But uh, it, it's, it's definitely something that, that needs to be uh, thought about. Thanks. Okay, the next one back. Jong Gyu Kim from NAOJ. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I have a question to Doris. Uh, so you mentioned these different types of uh, filament formation mechanisms. And my question is, uh, can these different mechanisms correspond to some different evolutionary stage of uh, filaments? For example, this type O uh, coming first, and then after that, uh, gravity begins to dominate, and this type uh, G type filament formation happens. And can we, uh, somehow observationally test, yeah, this kind of ideas? Uh, yes, so thank you for your uh, question. Um, so um, regarding the, the uh, filament formation modes that will form uh, uh, self-gravitating filament and self-forming filament, so this, uh, these are this, this type. Um, so as I said, uh, in order to, uh, the difference between type C and type O is on the um, uh, shock velocity. So if, so in shock velocity. And so actually, um, it's possible to uh, disentangle these two uh, types of uh, formation, filament formation from observations because they have characteristic velocity structures. Uh, so here I have a slide on this. Um, uh, so uh, for the type O, uh, so so if filament formation, uh, when the velocity shock velocity is very strong, you form a, a bent uh, sheet from which uh, the flow forms the filament, and this kind of structure. Um, ex, um, this kind of uh, formation mechanism expects uh, a velocity structure which is um, uh, shown by this V-shaped velocity structure on this position velocity diagram. And if the filaments are formed due to uh, turbulence or gravity in the sheet, uh, we expect to see this kind of um, velocity structures. So uh, it's, I think, very interesting to check in the observations if we can quantify and see this different uh, uh, velocity structure that would imply different uh, uh, modes of filament formation and also can help to maybe constrain uh, possible velocity of shock compression. Thank you. And so, yeah, in, in observations there are some observations showing this kind of V-shape uh, velocity structures, uh, and maybe some also tentative uh, uh, ve linear velocity gradients from this. But I think, yeah, it's very, it will be very in in interesting and important to try to do this statistically within a cloud to, to see which mechanism is uh, more dominant, because uh, as I said, uh, mm, the evolution of these filaments uh, can be different depending on the uh, shock compression velocity. Thank you. Mordecai Maclow, AMNH. Um, I, this is kind of a follow-up question now, um, which is why do we need the shock front to form a filament if gravity naturally forms sheets whose intersections are filamentary? Could we have a purely gravitational structure? Sure, it can be influenced by shocks that are around, but gravity alone is perfectly effective at forming filaments, isn't it? I don't know which of you wants to answer this. 
since Kate actually put up a future question, maybe her, but. Um, so, uh, so for, for example, in this uh, simulation here, um, let me see here. So in this simulation here, we have filament formation in a run where there is no gravity. So which means that uh, this filament form without without gravity. And then, then gravity is important for the evolution and the accretion of the, the filaments. And the idea of um, the importance of the formation of filaments in sheet-like structure is because in the observation we see uh, very commonly these um, velocity gradients across the filaments. And as I, I said, those velocity gradients, you cannot uh, see them if you are not in a sheet-like configuration. And so, and also the fact that we see bubbles everywhere, and so the bubbles compress uh, molecular clouds forming sheet-like structure. Uh, this suggests that the formation of filaments in sheet-like structure maybe is a very uh, widely spread mechanism. And uh, regarding gravity, so uh, if there are no density perturbation, the density in homogeneity, uh, you would expect to form a filament through gravity. But because you have uh, density and velocity perturbation, gravity, uh, uh, formation of filaments through gravity takes longer. And so what is faster is the formation through uh, turbulence. So in this kind of simulation, if you wait longer, then you will have formation of gravity um, formation of filaments through gravity, while you have you have formation of filaments through the other modes that is faster. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's running out of time, but actually this is one final uh, question. Maybe he is lining longer. Okay, so. <laughs> so thank you very much. So Shota Not from University of Tokyo. So my question is about uh, streamers, but different direction. So recently, the observations uh, detected many more, several molecules across the streamer. So, from theoretical point of view, uh, is there any typical temperature or of the streamer? So, the streamer is cold or warm? Do you, uh, would you please make a comment on that? Um, that's a, that's a, a good question. I mean, I, I would expect you know if the streamers are coming, you know, in these um, you know low mass cores. Uh, overall, the low mass cores are cold. The, the protostar isn't going to heat the gas, you know, significantly beyond, you know, a, a very close region. So I would expect the streamers would be cold as well, and that makes sense given that we're detecting them in, in these cold gas, uh, dense gas tracers. Um, but I haven't thought about, like, the theoretical prediction. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So let's thank the uh, both speaker again.